Section 34 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stroet, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 34. A Pleasant Evening. I passed into the park by the 5th Avenue and 59th Street gate. I could never bring myself to enter it through the gate that is guarded by the hideous pygmy statue of Thorwaldsen. The afternoon sun poured into the windows of the New Netherlands Hotel, setting every orange curtain pane a glitter, and tipping the wings of the bronze dragons with flame. Gorgeous masses of flowers blazed in the sunshine from the grey terraces of the Savoy, from the high grilled court of the Vanderbilt Palace, and from the balconies of the plaza opposite. The white marble façade of the Metropolitan Club was grateful relief in the universal glare, and I kept my eyes on it until I had crossed the dusty street and entered the shade of the trees. Before I came to the zoo, I smelled it. Next week it was to be removed to the fresh, cool woods and meadows in Bronx Park, far from the stifling air of the city, far from the infernal noise of the Fifth Avenue omnibuses. A noble stag stared at me from his enclosure among the trees as I passed down their winding asphalt walk. Never mind, old fellow, said I. You'll be splashing about in the Bronx River next week and cropping maple shoots to your heart's content. On I went, past herds of staring deer, past great lumbering elk and moose and long-faced African antelopes, until I came to the dens of the great carnivora. The tigers sprawled in the sunshine, blinking and licking their paws. The lions slept in the shade or squatted on their haunches, yawning gravely. A slim panther travelled to and fro behind her barred cage, pausing at times to peer wistfully out into the free, sunny world. My heart ached for caged wild things, and I walked on, glancing up now and then to encounter the blank stare of a tiger or the mean, shifty eyes of some ill-smelling hyena. Across the meadow I could see the elephants swaying and swinging their great heads, the sober bison solemnly slobbering over their cuds, the sarcastic countenances of camels, the wicked little zebras, and a lot more animals of the camel and llama tribe, all resembling each other, all equally ridiculous, stupid, deadly uninteresting. Somewhere behind the old arsenal an eagle was screaming, probably a Yankee eagle. I heard the chug-chug of a blowing hippopotamus, the squeal of a falcon, and the snarling yap of quarrelling wolves. A pleasant place for a hot day, I pondered bitterly, and I thought some things about Jamison that I shall not insert in this volume. But I lighted a cigarette to deaden the aroma from the hyenas, unclasped my sketching block, sharpened my pencil, and fell to work on a family group of hippopotami. They may have taken me for a photographer, for they all wore smiles as if welcoming a friend, and my sketch block presented a series of wide-open jaws, behind which shapeless, bulky bodies vanished in alarming perspective. The alligators were easy. They looked to me as though they had not moved since the founding of the zoo, but I had a bad time with the big bison, who persistently turned his tail to me, looking solidly around his flank to see how I stood it. So I pretended to be absorbed in the antics of two bear cubs, and the dreary old bison fell into the trap, for I made some good sketches of him, and laughed in his face as I closed the book. There was a bench by the abode of the eagles, and I sat down on it to draw the vultures and condors, motionless as mummies, among the piled rocks. Gradually I enlarged the sketch, bringing in the gravel plaza, the steps leading up to the Fifth Avenue, the sleepy park policeman in front of the arsenal, and a slim white-browed girl, dressed in shabby black, who stood silently in the shade of the willow trees. After a while I found that the sketch, instead of being a study of the eagles, was in reality a composition in which the girl in black occupied the principal point of interest. Unwittingly, I had subordinated everything else to her, the brooding vultures, the trees and the walks, and the half-indicated groups of sun-warmed loungers. She stood very still, her pallid face bent, her thin white hands loosely clasped before her. Rather dejected reverie, I thought. Probably she is out of work. Then I caught a glimpse of a sparkling diamond ring 
on the slender third finger of her left hand. ** She'll not starve with such a stone as that about her," I said to myself, looking curiously at her dark eyes and sensitive mouth. They were both beautiful, eyes and mouth, — beautiful, but touched with pain. After a while I rose and walked back to make a sketch or two of the lions and tigers. I avoided the monkeys. I can't stand them, and they never seem funny to me, poor dwarfish, degraded caricatures of all that is ignoble in ourselves. I've enough now, I thought. I'll go home and manufacture up a full page that will probably please Jamison. So I strapped the elastic band around my sketching block, replaced pencil and rubber in my waistcoat pocket, and strolled off toward the mall to smoke a cigarette in the evening glow before going back to my studio to work until midnight, up to the chin in charcoal grey and Chinese white. Across the long meadow I could see the roofs of the city faintly looming above the trees. A mist of amethyst, ever deepening, hung low on the horizon, and through it steeple and dome, roof and tower, and the tall chimneys where thin fillets of smoke curled idly were transformed into pinnacles of beryl and flaming minarets swimming in filmy haze slowly the enchantment deepened all that was ugly and shabby and mean had fallen away from the distant city and now it towered into the evening sky splendid gilded magnificent purified in the fierce furnace of the setting sun the red disc was half hidden now the tracery of trees feathery willow and budding birch darkened against the glow the fiery rays shot far across the meadow, gilding the dead leaves, staining with soft crimson the dark, moist tree trunks around me. Far across the meadow, a shepherd passed in the wake of a huddling flock, his dog at his heels, faint moving blots of grey. A squirrel sat up on the gravel walk in front of me, ran a few feet, and sat up again, so close that I could see the palpitation of his sleek flanks. Somewhere in the grass a hidden field insect was rehearsing last summer's solos. I heard the tap, tap, ta 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 tat of a woodpecker among the branches overhead and the querulous note of a sleepy robin. The twilight deepened. Out of the city the music of bells floated over wood and meadow. Faint, mellow whistles sounded from the river craft along the north shore, and the distant thunder of a gun announced the close of a June day. The end of my cigarette began to glimmer with a redder light. Shepherd and flock were blotted out in the dusk, and I only knew they were still moving when the sheep bells twinkled faintly. Then suddenly that strange uneasiness that all of us have known, that half-awakened sense of having seen it all before, of having been through it all, came over me, and I raised my head and slowly turned. A figure was sitting at my side. My mind was struggling with the instinct to remember something so vague and yet so familiar something that clouded thought yet challenged it something god knows what troubled me and now as i looked without interest at the dark figure beside me an apprehension totally involuntary an impatience to understand came upon me and i sighed and turned restlessly again to the fading west i thought i heard my sigh re-echoed i scarcely heeded and in a moment i sighed again dropped my burned-out cigarette on the gravel beneath my feet. "'Did you speak to me?' said someone in a low voice, so close that I swung around rather sharply. "'No,' I said after a moment's silence. It was a woman. I could not see her face clearly, but I saw on her clasped hands, which lay listlessly in her lap, the sparkle of a great diamond. I knew her at once. It did not need a glance of the shabby dress of black, the white face a pallid spot in the twilight, to tell me that I had her picture in my sketchbook. Do, do you mind if I speak to you? she asked timidly. The hopeless sadness in her voice touched me, and I said, Why, no, of course not. Can I do anything for you? Yes, she said, brightening a little. If you, you only would. I will if I can, said I cheerfully. What is it? Out of ready cash? No, not that, she said, shrinking back. I begged her pardon, a little surprised, and withdrew my hand from my change pocket. It is only, only that I wish you to take these. She drew a thin packet from her breast. These two letters. I? I asked, astonished. 
** Yes, if you will." ** But what am I to do with them ?" I de manded. ** I can't tell you. I only know that I must give them to you. Will you take them ?"** Oh yes, I *11 take them," I laughed. ** Am I to read them ?" I added to myself. ** It 's some clever begging trick." ** No," she answered slowly, ** you are not to read them ; you are to give them to somebody." ** To whom ?"** Anybody ?"** No, not to anybody." ** You will know whom to give them to when the time comes." ** Then I am to keep them until further in structions ?"** Your own heart will instruct you," she said in a scarcely audible voice. She held the thin packet toward me, and to humour her I took it. It was wet. ** The letters fell into the sea," she said. ** There was a photograph which should have gone with them, but the salt water washed it blank. Would you care if I asked you something else ?" I ? Oh, no." ** Then give me the picture that you made of me to day." I laughed again, and demanded how she knew I had drawn her. ** Is it like me ?" she said. ** I think it is very like you," I answered truthfully. ** Would you not give it to me ?" Now it was on the tip of my tongue to refuse, but I reflected that I had enough sketches for a full page without that one, so I handed it to her, nodded that she was welcome, and stood up. She rose also, the diamond flashing on her finger. ** You are sure you are not in want ?" I asked with a tinge of good-natured sarcasm. ** Hark !" she whispered. ** Listen. Do you hear the bells of the convent? I looked out into the misty night. ** There are no bells sounding," I said. ** At any way, there are no convent bells here. We are in New York, mademoiselle." I had noticed her French accent. ** We are in Protestant Yankee land, and the bells that ring are much less mellow than the bells of France. I turned pleasantly to say good night. She was gone. End of section 34 Read by Adrian Strowett Turks and Caicos Islands Section 35 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stroett, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 35. A Pleasant Evening. Have you ever drawn a picture of a corpse? inquired Jamison next morning, as I walked into his private room with a sketch of the proposed full page of the zoo. No, and I don't want to, I replied sullenly. Let me see your Central Park page, said Jamison in his gentle voice, and I displayed it. It was about worthless as far as artistic production, but it pleased Jamison, as I knew it would. Can you finish it by this afternoon? he asked, looking up at me with persuasive eyes. Oh, I suppose so. I said wearily. Anything else, Mr. Jamison? The corpse, he replied. I want a sketch by tomorrow. Finished. What corpse? I demanded, controlling my indignation as I met Jamison's soft eyes. There was a mute duel of glances. Jamison passed his hand across his forehead with a slight lifting of the eyebrows. I shall want it as soon as possible, he said in his caressing voice. What I thought was damned purring pussycat. What I said was, where is this corpse? In the morgue. Have you read the morning papers? No. Ah, as you very rightly observe, you are too busy to read the morning papers. Young men must learn industry first, of course. Of course. What you are to do is this. The San Francisco police have sent out an alarm regarding the disappearance of a Miss Tuft the millionaire's daughter, you know. Today a body was brought to the morgue here in New York, and it has been identified as the missing young lady by a diamond ring. Now I'm convinced that it isn't, and I'll show you why, Mr. Hilton. He picked up a pen and made a sketch of a ring on the margin of that morning's Tribune. That is the description of her ring as sent on from San Francisco. You notice the diamond is set in the center of the ring, where the two gold serpents' tails cross. Now, 
The ring on the finger of the woman in the Morgue is like this," and he rapidly sketched another ring where the diamond rested in the fangs of the two gold serpents. " That is the difference," he said, in his pleasant, even voice. " Rings like that are not uncommon," said I, remembering that I had seen such a ring on the finger of a white faced girl in the Park the evening before. Then a sudden thought took shape. Perhaps that was the girl whose body lay in the Morgue !" Well," said Jamison, looking up at me, ** what are you thinking about ?"** Nothing," I answered, but the whole scene was before my eyes, — the vultures brooding among the rocks, the shabby black dress and the pallid face, and the ring glittering on the slim white hand. ** Nothing," I repeated. ** When shall I go, Mr. Jamison ? Do you want a portrait, or what ?"** Portrait. Careful drawing of the ring, and — er — a centrepiece of the morgue at night. Might as well give people the horrors while we're about it." ** But," said I, ** the policy of this paper "** Never mind, Mr. Hilton," purred Jamison. ** I am able to direct the policy of this paper." ** I don't doubt you are," I said angrily. ** I am," he repeated, undisturbed and smiling. ** You see, this tuft case interests society. I am a uh, also interested." He held out to me the morning paper and pointed to a heading. I read, ** Miss Tuft dead. Her fiance was Mr. Jamison, the well-known editor." ** What !" I cried in horrified amazement, but Jamison had left the room, and I heard him chatting and laughing softly with some visitors in the press room outside. I flung down the paper and walked out. ** The cold-blooded toad !" I exclaimed again and again, making capital out of his fiancee's disappearance. Well, I... I'm damned. I knew he was a bloodless, heartless grip penny, but I never thought, I never imagined. Words failed me. Scarcely conscious of what I did, I drew a herald from my pocket and saw a column entitled, Miss Tuft Found, Identified by Ring, Wild Grief of Mr. Jamison, Her Fiancee. That was enough. I went out of the street and sat down in City Hall Park, and as I sat there a terrible resolution came to me. I would draw that dead girl's face in such a way that it would chill Jamison's sluggish blood. I would crowd the black shadows of the morgue with forms and ghastly faces, and every face should bear something in it of Jamison. Oh, I'd rouse him from his cold, snaky apathy. I'd confront him with death in such an awful form, that passionless, base, inhuman as he was, he'd shrink from it as he would from a dagger thrust. Of course I'd lose my place, but that did not bother me, for I'd decided to resign anyway, not having a taste for the society of human reptiles. And, as I sat there in the sunny park, furious, trying to plan a picture whose somber horror should leave in his mind an ineffaceable scar, I suddenly thought of the pale, black-robed girl in Central Park. Could it be her poor, slender body that lay among the shadows of the grim morgue? If ever a brooding despair was stamped on any face, I had seen its print on hers when she spoke to me in the park and gave me the letters. The letters! I had not thought of them since, but now I drew them from my pocket and looked at the addresses. Curious, I thought. The letters are still damp. They smell of salt water, too. I looked at the address again, written in the long, fine hand of an educated woman who had been bred in a French convent. Both letters bore the same name in French. Captain Dino, kindness of a stranger. Captain Dino, I repeated aloud. Confounded, I've heard that name. Now where the deuce? Where in the name of all that's queer? Somebody who had sat down on the bench beside me placed a heavy hand on my shoulder. It was the Frenchman, Sodger Charlie. You spoke my name, he said in apathetic tones. Your name? Captain Dino, he repeated. It is my name. I recognized him in spite of the black goggles he was wearing, and at the same moment, it flashed into my mind that Dino was the name of the traitor who had escaped. Ah, I remembered now. I am Captain Dino, he said again, and I saw his fingers closing on my coat sleeve. It may have been my involuntary movement of recoil, I don't know, but the fellow dropped my coat and sat straight up on the bench. I am Captain Dino, he said for the third time, 
charged with treason and under sentence of death. — And innocent, I muttered, before I was even conscious of having spoken. What was it that wrung those involuntary words from my lips? I shall never know, perhaps. But it was I, not he, who trembled, seized with a strange agitation, and it was I, not he, whose hand was stretched forth impulsively, touching his. Without a tremor, he took my hand, pressed it almost imperceptibly, and dropped it. Then I held both letters toward him, and, as he neither looked at them nor at me, I placed them in his hand. Then he started. Read them, I said. They are for you. Letters? He gasped in a voice that sounded like nothing human. Yes, they are for you. I know it now. Letters? Letters directed to me? Can you not see? I cried. Then he raised one frail hand and drew the goggles from his eyes, and as I looked I saw two tiny white specks exactly in the center of both pupils. Blind! I faltered. I have been unable to read for two years, he said. After a moment he placed the tip of one finger on the letters. They are wet, I said. Shall, would you like to have me read them? For a long time he sat silently in the sunshine, fumbling with his cane, and I watched him without speaking. At last he said, Read, Monsieur, and I took the letters and broke the seals. The first letter contained a sheet of paper, damp and discoloured, on which a few lines were written. My darling, I knew you were innocent. Here the writing ended, but in the blur beneath I read, Paris shall know, France shall know. For at last I have the proofs, and I am coming to find you, my soldier, and to place them in your own dear brave hands. They know, now, at the war ministry, they have a copy of the traitor's confession. But they dare not make it public. They dare not withstand the popular astonishment and rage. Therefore, I sail on Monday from Cherbourg by the Green Cross Line, to bring you back to your own again, where you will stand before all the world, without fear, without reproach. Aline. This, this is terrible, I stammered. Can God live and see such things done? But with his thin hand he gripped my arm again, bidding me read the other letter, and I shuddered at the menace in his voice. Then with his sightless eyes on me I drew the other letter from the wet, stained envelope, and before I was aware, before I understood the purport of what I saw, I had read aloud these half-effaced lines. The Lorient is sinking, an iceberg, mid-ocean. Goodbye. You are innocent. I love. The Lorient, I cried. It was the French steamer that was never heard from. The Lorient of the Green Cross Line. I'd forgotten, I... The loud crash of a revolver stunned me. My ears rang and ached with it as I shrank back from a ragged, dusty figure that collapsed on the bench beside me, shuddered a moment, and tumbled to the asphalt at my feet. The trampling of the eager, hard-eyed crowd, the dust and the taint of powder in the hot air, the harsh alarm of the ambulance clattering up Mail Street, these I remember as I knelt there helplessly, holding the dead man's hands in mine. Soldier Charlie, mused the sparrow policeman, Shot himself, didn't he, Mr. Hilton? You seen him, sir? Blowed the top of his head off, didn't he, Mr. Hilton? Soldier Charlie, they repeated. A French dago what shot himself. And the words echoed in my ears long after the ambulance rattled away and the increasing throng dispersed suddenly as a couple of policemen cleared a space around the pool of thick blood on the asphalt. They wanted me as a witness, and I gave my card to one of the policemen who knew me. The rabble transferred its fascinated stare to me, and I turned away and pushed a path between frightened shop girls and ill-smelling loafers until I lost myself in the human torrent of Broadway. The torrent took me with it where it flowed, east, west, I did not notice nor care, but I passed on through the throng, listless, deadly weary of attempting to solve God's justice, striving to understand his purpose, his laws, his judgments, which are true and righteous altogether. End of section 35 Read by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands
Section 36 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 36. A Pleasant Evening. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and honeycomb. I turned sharply toward the speaker who shambled at my elbow. His sunken eyes were dull and lustreless, his bloodless face gleamed pallid as a death mask above the blood red jersey, the emblem of the soldiers of Christ. I don't know why I stopped, lingering, but as he passed I said, Brother, I also was meditating about God's wisdom and his testimonies. The pale fanatic shot a glance at me, hesitated, and fell into my own pace walking by my side. Under the peak of his Salvation Army cap, his eyes shone in the shadow with a strange light. Tell me more, I said, sinking my voice below the roar of the traffic, the clang, clang of the cable cars, and the noise of feet on the worn pavements. Tell me of his testimonies. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can answer his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. It is holy scripture that you quote, I said. I also can read that when I choose, but it cannot clear for me the reasons. It cannot make me understand. What? he asked and muttered to himself. That, for instance, I replied, pointing to a cripple who had been born deaf and dumb and horribly misshapen, a wretched diseased lump on the sidewalk below St. Paul's churchyard, a sore-eyed thing that mouthed and mowed and rattled pennies in a tin cup as though the sound of copper could stem the human pack that passed hot on the scent of gold then the man who shambled beside me turned and looked long and earnestly into my eyes and after a moment a dull recollection stirred within me a vague something that seemed like the awakening memory of a past long long forgotten dim dark too subtle too frail too indefinite ah the old feeling that all men have known, the old strange uneasiness, that useless struggle to remember when and where it all occurred before. And the man's head sank on his crimson jersey, and he muttered, muttered to himself of God and love and compassion, until I saw that the fierce heat of the city had touched his brain, and I went away and left him prating of mysteries that none but such as he dare name. So I passed on through dust and heat, and the hot breath of men touched my cheek and eager eyes looked into mine, eyes, eyes, that met my own and looked through them, beyond, far beyond to where gold glittered amid the mirage of eternal hope. Gold! It was in the air where the soft sunlight gilded the floating moats. It was underfoot in the dust that the sun made gilt. It glimmered through every window pane where the long red beams struck golden sparks above the gasping gold hunting hordes of Wall Street. High, high in the deepening sky, the tall buildings towered and the breeze from the bay lifted from the sun dyed flags of commerce until they waved above the turmoil of the hives below, waved courage and hope and strength to those who lusted after gold. The sun dipped low behind Castle William as I turned listlessly into the battery, and the long straight shadows of the trees stretched away over Green's Ward and Ashfelt Walk. Already the electric lights were glimmering among the foliage, although the bay shimmered like polished brass, and the top sails of the ships glowed with a deeper hue, where the red sun rays fall athwart the rigging. Old men tottered along the sea wall, tapping the asphalt with worn canes. Old women, crept to and fro in the coming twilight, old women who carried baskets that gaped for charity or bulged with mouldy stuffs. Food? Clothing? I could not tell. I did not care to know. 
The heavy thunder from the parapets of Castle William died away over the placid bay. The last red arm of the sea shot up out of the sea and wavered and faded into the sombre tones of the afterglow. Then came the night, timidly at first, touching sky and water with grey fingers, folding the foliage into soft massed shapes, creeping onward, onward, more swiftly now, until colour and form had gone from all the earth and the world was a world of shadows. As I sat there, on the dusky sea wall, gradually the bitter thoughts faded, and I looked out into the calm night with something of that peace that comes to all when day is ended. The death at my very elbow of the poor blind wretch in the park had left a shock, but now my nerves relaxed their tension, and I began to think about it all, about the letters and the strange woman who had given them to me. I wondered where she had found them, whether they really were carried by some vagrant current into the shore from the wreck of the fated Lorient. Nothing but these letters had human eyes encountered from the Lorient, although we believed that fire or burg had been her portion, for there had been no storms when the Lorient steamed away from Cherbourg. And what of the pale-faced girl in black, who had given these letters to me, saying that my own heart would teach me where to place them? I felt in my pockets for the letters where I had thrust them, all crumpled and wet. They were there, and I decided to turn them over to the police. Then I thought of Cusick and the City Hall Park, and these set my mind running on Jamison and my own work. Ah, I'd forgotten that. I had forgotten that I'd sworn to stir Jamison's cold, sluggish blood, trading on his fiancée's reported suicide. or oh, murder! True, he had told me that he was satisfied that the body at the morgue was not Miss Tufts, because the ring did not correspond with his fiancée's ring. But what sort of man was that? To go crawling and nosing about morgues and graves for a full-page illustration which might sell a few extra thousand papers. I had never known he was such a man. It was strange, too, for that was not the sort of illustration that the weekly used. It was against all precedent, against the whole policy of the paper. He would lose a hundred subscribers where he would gain one by such work. The callous brute, I muttered to myself. I'll wake him up. Oh, I sat straight up on the bench and looked steadily at a figure which was moving toward me under the spluttering electric light. It was the woman I had met in the park. She came straight up to me, her pale face gleaming like marble in the dark, her slim hands outstretched. I have been looking for you all day, all day she said in the same low, thrilling tones. I want the letters back. Have you them here? Yes, I said. I have them here. Take them in heaven's name. They have done enough evil for one day. She took the letters from my hand. I saw the ring, made of the double serpents, flashing on her slim finger, and I stepped closer and looked her in the eyes. Who are you? I asked. I? My name is no importance to you, she answered. You are right, I said. I do not care to know your name. That ring of yours. What of my ring? She muttered. Nothing. A dead woman lying in the morgue wears such a ring. Do you know what your letters have done? No? Well, I read them to a miserable wretch, and he blew his brains out. You read them to a man? I did. He killed himself. Who was that man? Captain D'Igno. With something between a sob and a laugh, she seized my hand and covered it with kisses, and I, astonished and angry, pulled my hand away from her cold lips and sat down on the bench. You needn't thank me, I said sharply, if I had known that, but no matter. Perhaps after all the poor devil is better off somewhere in other regions with his sweetheart who was drowned. Yes, I imagine he is. He was blind and ill, and broken-hearted. Blind? she asked gently. Yes. Did you know him? I knew him. And his sweetheart, Aileen. Aileen, she repeated softly. She is dead. I come to thank you in her name. For what? For his death? Ah, yes, for that. Where did you get those letters? I asked her suddenly. She did not answer but stood fingering the wet letters. 
Before I could speak again she moved away into the shadows of the trees, lightly, silently, and far down the dark walk I saw her diamond flashing. Grimly brooding, I rose and passed through the battery to the steps of the elevated road. These I climbed, bought my ticket, and stepped out to the damp platform. When a train came I crowded in with the rest, still pondering on my vengeance, feeling and believing that I was to scourge the conscience of the man who speculated on death. And at last the train stopped at 28th Street, and I hurried out and down the steps and away to the morgue. When I entered the morgue, Skelton, the keeper, was standing before a slab that glistened faintly under the wretched gas jets. He heard my footsteps and turned around to see who was coming. Then he nodded, saying, Mr. Hilton, just take a look at this here stiff. I'll be back in a moment. This is the one that all the papers take to be Miss Tuft, but they're all off, because this stiff has been here now for two weeks. I drew out my sketching block and pencils. Which is it, Skelton? I asked, fumbling for my rubber. This one, Mr. Hilton. The girl what's smiling. Picked up off Sandy Hook, too. Looks as if she was asleep, eh? What's she got in her hand? Clenched tight. Oh, a letter. Turn up the gas, Skelton. I want to see her face. The old man turned the gas jet and the flame blazed and whistled in the damp, fetid air. Then suddenly my eyes fell on the dead. Rigid, scarcely breathing, I stared at the ring, made of two twisted serpents set with a great diamond. I saw the wet letters crushed in her slender hand. I looked, and, God help me, I looked upon the dead face of the girl with whom I had been speaking on the battery. Dead for a month at least said Skelton calmly. Then, as I felt my senses leaving me, I screamed out, and at the same instant somebody from behind seized my shoulder and shook me savagely, shook me until I opened my eyes again and gasped and coughed. Now then, young fella, said a park policeman bending over me, if you go to sleep on a bench, somebody will lift your watch. I turned, rubbing my eyes desperately. Then it was all a dream and no shrinking girl had come to me with damp letters. I had not gone to the office. There was no such person as Miss Tuft. Jamison was not an unfeeling villain. No, indeed. He treated us all much better than we deserved, and he was kind and generous, too. And the ghastly suicide. Thank God that was also a myth. And the morgue and the battery at night where the pale-faced girl had... Oh! I felt for my sketchbook, found it turned the pages of all the animals that I had sketched, the hippopotami, the buffalo, the tigers. Ah, where was that sketch in which I had made the woman in shabby black, the principal figure, with the brooding vultures all around and the crowd and the sunshine? It was gone. I hunted everywhere, in every pocket. It was gone. At last I rose and moved along the narrow asphalt path in the falling twilight. And as I turned into the broader walk, I was aware of a group, a policeman holding a lantern, some gardeners, a knot of loungers gathered about something, a dark mass on the ground. Found them just so, one of the gardeners was saying. Better not touch them until the coroner comes. The policeman shifted his bull's eye a little. The rays fell on two faces, on two bodies, half supported against a park bench. On the finger of the girl glittered a splendid diamond set between the fangs of two gold serpents. The man had shot himself. He clasped two wet letters in his hand. The girl's clothing and hair were wringing wet, and her face was the face of a drowned person. Well, sir, said the policeman, looking at me, you seem to know these two people by your looks. I never saw them before, I gasped and walked on, trembling in every nerve. For among the folds of her shabby black dress, I had noticed the end of a paper. My sketch that I had missed. End of section 36. Read by Adrian Strowett. Turks and Caicos Islands. Section 37 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stroet, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 37. The Man at the Next Table. It was high noon in the city of Antwerp. From slender steeples floated the mellow music of the Flemish bells, and in the spire of the great cathedral across the square, the cracked chimes clashed discords until my ears ached. When the fiend in the cathedral had jerked the last tuneless clang from the chimes, I removed my fingers from my ears and sat down at one of the iron tables in the court. A waiter, with his face shaved blue, brought me a bottle of Rhine wine, a tumble of cracked ice, and a siphon. Does Monsieur desire anything else? he inquired. Yes, the head of the cathedral bell ringer. Bring it with vinegar and potatoes, I said bitterly. Then I began to ponder on my great aunt and the crimson diamond. The white walls of the Hotel Saint Antoine rose in a rectangle around the sunny court, casting long shadows across the basin of the fountain. The strip of blue overhead was cloudless. Sparrows twittered under the eaves, the yellow awnings fluttered, the flowers swayed in the summer breeze, and the jet of the fountain splashed among the water plants. On the sunny side of the piazza, the tables were vacant. On the shady side, I was lazily aware that the tables behind me were occupied, but I was indifferent as to their occupants, partly because I shunned all tourists, partly because I was thinking of my great-aunt. Most old ladies are eccentric, but there is a limit, and my great-aunt had overstepped it. I had believed her to be wealthy. She died bankrupt. Still, I knew there was one thing she did possess, and that was the famous crimson diamond. Now, of course, you know who my great-aunt was. Excepting the Koh-i-Noor and the Regent, this enormous and unique stone was, as everybody knows, the most valuable gem in existence. Any ordinary person would have placed that diamond in a safe deposit. My great-aunt did nothing of the kind. She kept it in a small velvet bag which she carried about her neck. She never took it off, but wore it dangling openly on her heavy silk gown. In this same bag she also carried dried catnip leaves, of which she was inordinately fond. Nobody but myself, her only living relative, knew that the crimson diamond lay among the sprigs of catnip in the little velvet bag. Harold, she would say, do you think I'm a fool? If I placed the crimson diamond in any safe deposit vault in New York, somebody would steal it sooner or later. Then she would nibble a sprig of catnip and peer cunningly at me. I loathed the odour of catnip, and she knew it. I also loathed cats. This, also, she knew, and of course surrounded herself with a dozen. Poor old lady. On the first day of March, 1896, she was found dead in her bed, in her apartments at the Waldorf. The doctor said she died from natural causes. The only other occupant of her sleeping room was a cat. The cat fled when we broke open the door, and I heard that she was received and cherished by some people in a neighbouring apartment. Now, although my great-aunt's death was due to purely natural causes, there was one very startling and disagreeable feature of the case. The velvet bag containing the crimson diamond had disappeared. Every inch of the apartment was searched, the floors torn up, the walls dismantled, but the crimson diamond had vanished. Chief of Police Conlon detailed four of his best men on the case, and as I had nothing better to do, I enrolled myself as a volunteer. I also offered $25,000 reward for the recovery of the gem. All New York was agog. The case seemed hopeless enough. Although there were five of us after the thief, McFarlane was in London and had been for a month, but Scotland Yard could give him no help. And the last I heard of him, he was roaming through Surrey after a man with a white spot in his hair. Harris had gone to Paris. He kept writing me that clues were plenty and the scent hot, 
But as Dennett in Berlin and Clancy in Vienna wrote me the same thing, I began to doubt these gentlemen's ability. ** You say," I answered Harrison, ** that the fellow is a Frenchman, and that he is now concealed in Paris. But Dennett writes me by the same mail that the thief is undoubtedly a German, and was seen yesterday in Berlin. To day I received a letter from Clancy, assuring me that Vienna holds the culprit, and that he is an Austrian from Trieste. Now, for heaven's sake !'* I ended. Let me alone, and stop writing me letters until you have something to write about. The night clerk of the Waldorf had furnished me with our first clue. On the night of my aunt's death, he had seen a tall, grave-faced man hurriedly leave the hotel. As the man passed the desk, he removed his hat and mopped his forehead, and the night clerk noticed that in the middle of his head there was a patch of hair as white as snow. We worked this clue for all it was worth, and a month later I received a cable dispatch from Paris saying that a man answering to the description of the Waldorf suspect had offered an enormous crimson diamond for sale to the jeweller in the Palais Royal. Unfortunately, the fellow took fright and disappeared before the jeweller could send for the police, and since that time, McFarlane in London, Harrison in Paris, Dennett in Berlin and Clancy in Vienna, had been chasing men with white patches on their hair until no grey-headed patriarch in Europe was free from suspicion. I myself had sleuthed it through England, France, Holland and Belgium, and now I found myself in Antwerp at the Hotel Saint Antoine, without a clue that promised anything except another outrage on some respectable white-haired citizen. The case seemed hopeless enough, unless the thief tried again to sell the gem. Here was our only hope, for unless he cut the stone into smaller ones, he had no more chance of selling it than he would have had if he had stolen the Venus of Milo and peddled her about the Rue de Seine. Even were he to cut up the stone, no respectable gem collector or jeweller would buy a crimson diamond without first notifying me, for although a few red stones are known to collectors, the colour of the crimson diamond was absolutely unique and there was little probability of an honest mistake. Thinking of all these things, I sat sipping my Rhine wine in the shadow of the yellow awnings. A large white cat came sauntering by and stopped in front of me to perform her toilet until I wished she would go away. After a while she sat up, licked her whiskers, yawned once or twice, and was about to stroll on when, catching sight of me, she stopped short and looked me squarely in the face. I returned the attention with a scowl because I wished to discourage any advances towards social intercourse which she might contemplate, but after a while her steady gaze disconcerted me, and I turned to my Rhine wine. A few minutes later I looked up again. The cat was still eyeing me. Now what the devil is the matter with the animal? I muttered. Does she recognize in me a relative? Perhaps, observed a man at the next table. What do you mean by that? I demanded. What I say, replied the man at the next table. I looked at him full in the face. He was old and bald and appeared weak-minded. His age protected his impudence. I turned my back on him when my eyes fell on the cat again. She was still gazing earnestly at me. Disgusted that she should take such pointed public notice of me, I wondered whether other people saw it. I wondered whether there was anything peculiar in my own personal appearance. How hard the creature stared. It was most embarrassing. What has got into that cat? I thought. It's sheer impudence. It's an intrusion, and I won't stand it. The cat did not move. I tried to stare her out of countenance. It was useless. There was aggressive inquiry in her yellow eyes. A sensation of uneasiness began to steal over me, a sensation of embarrassment not unmixed with awe. All cats looked alike to me, and yet there was something about this one that bothered me, something that I could not explain to myself, but which began to occupy me. She looked familiar, this Antwerp cat. An odd sense of having seen her before, of having been well acquainted with her in former years, slowly settled on my mind, and although I could never remember the time when I had not detested cats, I was almost convinced that my relations with this Antwerp tabby had once been intimate, 
if not cordial. I looked more closely at the animal. Then an idea struck me, an idea which persisted and took definite shape in spite of me. I strove to escape from it, to evade it, to stifle and smother it. An inward struggle ensued, which brought the perspiration in beads upon my cheeks. A struggle short, sharp, decisive. It was useless, useless to try to put it from me. This idea, so wretchedly bizarre, so grotesque and fantastic, so utterly inane, it was useless to deny that the cat bore a distinct resemblance to my great aunt. I gazed at her in horror. What enormous eyes the creature had! Blood is thicker than water, said the man at the next table. What does he mean by that? I muttered angrily, swallowing a tumbler of Rhine wine and seltzer. But it did not turn. What was the use? Chattering old imbecile, I added to myself, and struck a match when my cigar was out. But as I raised the match to relight it, I encountered the cat's eyes again. I could not enjoy my cigar with the animal staring at me, but I was justly indignant and did not intend to be rooted. The idea! Forced to leave for a cat? I sneered. We will see who will be the one to go. I tried to give her a jet of seltzer from the siphon, but the bottle was too nearly empty to carry far. Then I attempted to lure her nearer, calling her in French, German, and English, but she did not stir. I did not know the Flemish for cat. She's got a name and won't come, I thought. Now, what under the sun can I call her? Auntie, suggested the man at the next table. I sat perfectly still. Could that man have answered my thoughts? For I had not spoken aloud. Of course not. It was a coincidence. But a very disgusting one. Auntie, I repeated mechanically. Auntie, auntie. Good gracious, how horribly human that cat looks. Then somehow or other, Shakespeare's words crept into my head, and I found myself repeating. The soul of his grandam might happily inhabit a bird. The soul of his grandam might happily inhabit a bird. The soul of... Nonsense, I growled. It isn't printed correctly. One might possibly say, speaking in poetical metaphor, that the soul of a bird might happily inhabit one's grandam. I stopped short, flushing painfully. What awful rot, I murmured, and lighted another cigar. The cat was still staring. The cigar went out. I grew more and more nervous. What rot? I repeated. Pythagoras must have been an ass, but I do believe that there are plenty of asses alive today who swallow that sort of thing. Who knows? sighed the man at the next table, and I sprang to my feet and wheeled about. But I only caught a glimpse of a pair of frayed coat-tails and a bald head vanishing into the dining room. I sat down again, thoroughly indignant. A moment later, the cat got up and went away. End of section 37 Read by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands Section 38 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stroet, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 38. The Man at the Next Table. Daylight was fading in the city of Antwerp. Down into the sea sank the sun, tinting the vast horizon with flakes of crimson, and touching with rich deep undertones the tossing waters of the Scheld. Its glow fell like a rosy mantle over red tiled roofs and meadows, and through the haze the spires of twenty churches pierced the air like sharp gilded flames. To the west and south, the green plains over which the Spanish armies tramped so long ago stretched away until they met the sky. The enchantment of the afterglow had turned old Antwerp 
into fairyland, and sea and sky and plain were beautiful and vague as the night mists floating in the moats below. Along the sea wall, from the Rubens Gate, all Antwerp strolled and chattered and flirted and sipped their Flemish wines from slender Flemish glasses, or gossiped over crugs of foaming beer. From the Scheld came the cries of sailors, the creaking of cordage, and the puff, puff of the ferry boats. On the bastions of the fortress opposite, a bugler was standing. Twice the mellow notes of the bugler came faintly over the water. Then a great gun thundered from the ramparts, and the Belgian flag fluttered along the lanyards to the ground. I leaned listlessly on the sea wall and looked down at the shell below. A battery of artillery was embarking for the fortress. The tub-like transport lay hissing and whistling in the slip, and the stamping of horses, the rumbling of gun and caisson, and the sharp cries of the officers came plainly to the ear. When the last caisson was aboard and stowed, and the last trooper had sprung jingling to the deck, the transport puffed out into the scheldt, and I turned away through the throng of promenaders, and found a little table on the terrace just outside of the pretty café. And as I sat down, I became aware of a girl at the next table, a girl all in white, the most ravishingly and distractingly pretty girl that I had ever seen. In the agitation of the moment, I forgot that I was a woman hater. I forgot my name, my fortune, my aunt, and the crimson diamond. All these I forgot in the purely human impulse to see clearly, and to that end I removed my monocle from my left eye. Some moments later I came to myself and feebly replaced it. It was too late. The mischief was done. I was not aware at first of the exact state of my feelings, for I had never before been in love, but I did know that at her request I would have been proud to stand on my head or turn a flip-flap into the shelter. I did not stare at her, but I managed to see her most of the time when my eyes were in another direction. I found myself drinking something which a waiter brought presumably upon an order which I did not remember having given. Later I noticed that it was a loathsome drink, which the Belgians call American grog, but I swallowed it and lighted a cigarette. As the fragrant cloud rose in the air, a voice which I recognized with a chill broke into my dream of enchantment. Could he have been there all the while, there sitting beside that vision in white? His hat was off, and the ocean breezes whispered about his bald head. His frayed coat tails were folded carefully over his knees, and between the thumb and forefinger of his left hand he balanced a bad cigar. He looked at me in a mildly cheerful way and said, I know now. Know what? I asked, thinking it better to humour him, for I was convinced that he was mad. I know why cats bite. This was startling. I hadn't the vaguest idea what to say. I know why, he repeated. Can you guess why? There was a covert tone of triumph in his voice, and he smiled encouragement. Come, try and guess, he urged. I was uneasy, but I told him with stiff civility that I was equal to any problems. Listen, young man, he continued, folding his coat tails closely about his legs. Try to reason it out. Why should cats bite? Don't you know? I do. He looked at me anxiously. You take no interest in this problem he demanded. Oh, yes. Then why do you not ask me why? He said, looking vaguely disappointed. Well, I said in desperation, why, why do cats bite? Hang it all, I thought. It's like a burnt cork show, and I'm Mr. Bones and he's Tambo. Then he smiled gently. Young man, he said, cats bite because they feed on catnip. I've reasoned it out. I stared at him in blank astonishment. Was this benevolent-looking old party poking fun at me? Was he paying me up for the morning snub? Was he a malignant and revengeful old party, or was he merely feeble-minded? Who might he be? What was he doing here in Antwerp? What was he doing now? For the bald one had turned familiarly to the beautiful girl in white. Elsie, he said, do you feel chilly? The girl shook her head. Not in the least, Papa. Good Lord! thought her father i've been to the zoo today announced the bald one turning toward me ah 
** Indeed," I observed, ** er — I trust you enjoyed it ?"** I have been contemplating the apes," he con tinued, dreamily, ** yes, contemplating the apes." I said nothing, but tried to look interested. ** Yes, the apes," he murmured, fixing his mild eyes on me. Then he leaned toward me confidentially and whispered, ** Can you tell me what a monkey thinks ?"** I cannot," I replied sharply. ** Ah," he sighed, sinking back in his chair and patting the slender hand of the girl beside him, ** ah, who can tell what a monkey thinks ?" His gentle face lulled my suspicions, and I replied very gravely, ** Who can tell whether they think at all ?"** True, true ; who can tell whether they think at all ? And if they do think — ah ? Who can tell what they think ?"*' But," I began, ** if you can't tell whether they think at all, what 's the use of trying to conjecture what they would think if they did think ?" He raised his hand in deprecation. ** Ah, it is exactly that which is of such absorbing interest, exactly that. It is the obtuseness of the proposition which stimulates research, which stirs profoundly the brain of the thinking world. The question is of vital and instant importance. Possibly you have already formed an opinion." I submitted that I had thought but little on the subject. ** I doubt," he continued, swathing his knees in his coat tails, ** I doubt whether you have given much attention to the subject lately discussed by the Boston Dodo Society of Pythagorean Research." ** I am not sure," I said politely, ** that I recall that particular discussion. May I ask what was the question brought up ?"** The Felis Domesticus question." ** Ah, that must indeed be interesting. And — er — what may be the Felis Do — Do — Domesticus ?" Not Dodo, Felis Domesticus, the common or garden cat." ** Indeed," I murmured. ** You are not listening," he said. I only half heard him. I could not turn my eyes from her face. ** Cat !" shouted the bald one, and I almost leapt from my chair. ** Are you deaf ?" he inquired sympathetically. ** No, oh no," I replied, colouring with confusion. ** You were — pardon me, you were — er — speaking of the dodo. Extraordinary bird that "** I was not discussing the dodo," he sighed. ** I was speaking of cats." ** Of course," I said. ** The question is," he continued, twisting his frayed coat tails into a sort of rope, ** the question is, how are we to ameliorate the present condition and social status of our domestic cats ?"** Feed 'em," I suggested. He raised both hands. They were eloquent with patient expostulation. ** I mean their spiritual condition," he said. I nodded, but my eyes reverted to that exquisite face. She sat silent, her eyes fixed on the waning flecks of colour in the western sky. ** Yes," repeated the bald one, ** the spiritual welfare of our domestic cats." ** Toms and tabbies," I murmured. ** Exactly," he said, tying a large knot in his coat tails. ** You will ruin your coat," I observed. ** Papa !" exclaimed the girl, turning in dismay as the gentleman gave a guilty start. ** Stop it at once !" He smiled apologetically and made a feeble attempt to conceal his coat tails. ** My dear," he said with gentle deprecation, ** I am so absent-minded. I always do it in the heat of argument." The girl rose, and bending over her untidy parent, deftly untied the knot in his flapping coat. When it was disentangled, she sat down and said, with a ghost of a smile, ** He is so very absent-minded. ''** Your father is evidently a great student," I said pleasantly. ** How I pitied her, tied to this lunatic." ** Yes, he is a great student," she said quietly. ** I am," he murmured. ** That's what makes me so absent-minded. I often go to bed and forget to sleep." Then looking at me, he asked me my name, adding with a bow that his name was P. Royal Wyeth, Professor of Pythagorean Research, an abstruse paradox. My first name is Penny, named after Professor Penny of Harvard, he said, but I seldom use my first name in connection with my second, 
as the combination suggests a household remedy of penetrating odour. " My name is Kensett," I said, " Harold Kensett of New York. Student — er — a little. Student of diamonds." I smiled. " Oh, I see you know who my great aunt was," I said. " I know her," he said. " Ah, perhaps you are unaware that my great aunt is not now living." " I know her," he repeated, obstinately. I bowed. What a crank he was !" What do you study ?"*' You don't fiddle away all your time, do you ?" he asked. Now that was just what I did, but I was not pleased to have Miss Wyeth know it. Although my time was chiefly spent in shooting and fishing, I had once, in a fit of energy, succeeded in stuffing and mounting a woodcock. So I evaded a humiliating confession by saying that I had done a little work in ornithology. ** Good !" cried the Professor, beaming all over. ** I knew you were a fellow scientist. Possibly you are a brother member of the Boston Dodo Society of Pythagorean Research. Are you a dodo ?" I shook my head. ** No, I am not a dodo." ** Only a jay ?"** A what ?" I said angrily. ** A jay. We call the members of the Junior Ornithological Jay Society of New York jays, just as we refer to ourselves as dodos. Are you not even a jay ?"** I am not," I said, watching him suspiciously. ** I must convert you, I see," said the Professor, smiling. ** I am afraid I do not approve of Pythagorean research," I began. But the beautiful Miss Wyeth turned to me very seriously and looked me frankly in the eyes, said, I trust you will be open to conviction. Good Lord, I thought, can she be another crank? I looked at her steadily. What a little beauty she was. She also then belonged to the Pythagoreans, a sect of despised. Everybody knows all about the Pythagorean craze, its rise in Boston, its rapid spread and its subsequent consolidation with Theosophy, Hindpotism, the Salvation Army, the Shakers, the Dunkards, and the Mind Cure Cult upon a business basis. I had hitherto regarded all Pythagoreans with the same scornful indifference which I accorded to the Faith Curists. Being a member of the Catholic Church, I was scarcely prepared to take any of them seriously. Least of all did I approve of the business basis, and I looked very much askance, indeed at the scientific and religious trust company duly incorporated and generally known as the pythagorean trust which consolidating with mind curists faith curists and other flourishing salvation syndicates actually claimed a place among ordinary trusts and at the same time pretended to a control over man's future life no i could never listen i was ashamed of even entertaining the notion and i shook my head no miss wyeth I'm afraid I do not care to listen to any reasoning on this subject. Don't you believe in Pythagoras? demanded the professor, subduing his excitement with difficulty, and adding another knot to his coat tails. No, I said, I do not. How do you know you don't? inquired the professor. Because, I said firmly, it is nonsense to say that the soul of a human being can inhabit a hen. Put it in a more simplified form, insisted the professor. Do you not believe that the soul of a hen can inhabit a human being? No, I don't. Did you ever hear of a hen-pecked man? cried the professor, his voice ending in a shout. I nodded, intensely annoyed. Would you listen to reason then? he continued eagerly. No, I began, but I caught Miss Wyeth's blue eyes fixed on mine with an expression so sad, so sweetly appealing, that I faltered. Yes, I will listen, I said faintly. Will you become my pupil? insisted the professor. I was shocked to find myself wavering, but my eyes were looking into hers, and I could not disobey what I read there. The longer I looked, the greater inclination I felt to waver. I saw that I was going to give in, and, strangest of all, my conscience did not trouble me. I felt it coming. A sort of mild exhilaration took possession of me. For the first time in my life I became reckless, I even gloried in my recklessness. Yes, yes, I cried, leaning eagerly across the table. I shall be glad, delighted. Will you take me as your pupil? My single eyeglass fell from its position unheeded. Take me. Oh, will you take me? I cried. Instead of answering, the professor blinked rapidly at me for a moment. 
I imagined his eyes had grown bigger and were assuming a greenish tinge. The corners of his mouth began to quiver, emitting queer, caressing little noises, and he rapidly added knot after knot to his twitching coat-tails. Suddenly he bent forward across the table until his nose almost touched mine. The pupils of his eyes expanded, the iris assuming a beautiful changing golden-green tinge, and his coat-tails twitched violently. Then he began to mew. I strove to rouse myself from my paralysis. I tried to shrink back, for I felt the end of his cold nose touch mine. I could not move. The cry of terror died in my straining throat. My hands tightened convulsively. I was incapable of speech or motion. At the same time, my brain became wonderfully clear. I began to remember everything that had ever happened to me, everything that I had ever done or said. I even remembered things that I had neither done nor said. I recalled distinctly much that had never happened. How fresh and strong my memory! The past was like a mirror, crystal clear, and there, in glorious tints and hues, the scenes of my childhood grew and glowed and faded and gave place to newer and more splendid scenes. For a moment the episode of the cat at the Hotel Saint Antoine flashed across my mind. When it vanished, a chilly stupor slowly clouded my brain. The scenes, the memories, the brilliant colours faded, leaving me enveloped in a grey vapour through which the two great eyes of the professor twinkled with a murky light. A peculiar longing stirred me, a strange yearning for something, I knew not what, but, oh, how I longed and yearned for it! Slowly, this indefinite, incomprehensible longing became a living pain. Ah, how I suffered, and how the vapours seemed to crowd around me! Then, as at a great distance, I heard her voice, sweet, imperative, Mew, she said. For a moment I seemed to see the interior of my own skull, lighted as by a flash of fire, the rolling eyeballs veined in scarlet, the glistening muscles quivering along the jaw, the humid masses of the convoluted brain. Then awful darkness, a darkness almost tangible, an utter blackness through which now seemed to creep a thin silver thread, like a river crawling across a world like a thought gliding to the brain, like a song, a thin, sharp song which some distant voice was singing, which I was singing, and I knew that I was mewing. I threw myself back in the chair and mewed with all my heart. Oh, that heavy load which was lifted from my breast! How good, how satisfying it was to mew, and how I did mew! I gave myself up to it, heart and soul, my whole being thrilled with the passionate outpourings of a spirit freed, my voice trembled in the upper bars of a feline love song, quavered, descended, swelling again into an intimation that I brooked no rival, and ended with a magnificent crescendo. I finished, somewhat abashed, and glanced askance at the professor and his daughter, but the one sat nonchalantly disentangling his coat-tails, and the other was apparently absorbed in the distant landscape. Evidently they did not consider me ridiculous. Flushing painfully, I turned in my chair to see how my gruesome solo had affected the people on the terrace. Nobody even looked at me. This, however, gave me little comfort, for, as I began to realise what I had done, my mortification and rage knew no bounds. I was ready to die of shame. What on earth had induced me to mew? I looked wildly about for escape. I would leap up, rush home to bury my burning face in my pillows, and later in the friendly cabin of a homeward-bound steamer. I would fly, fly at once. Woe to the man who blocked my way. I started to my feet, but at that moment I caught Miss Wyatt's eyes fixed on me. Don't go, she said. What in earth's name lay in those blue eyes? I slowly sank back into my chair. Then the professor spoke. Elsie, I have just received the dispatch. Where from, Papa? From India. I'm going at once. She nodded her head without turning her eyes from the sea. Is it important, Papa? I should say so. The cashier of the trust has eloped with an astral body and has taken all our funds, including a lot of first mortgages on Nirvana. I suppose he's been dabbling in futures and was short in his accounts. I shan't be gone long. Then good night, Papa, she said, kissing him. Try to be back by eleven. I sat stupidly staring at them. 
** Oh, it 's only to Bombay. I shan't go to Tibet to night. Good night, my dear," said the Professor. Then a singular thing occurred. The Professor had at last succeeded in disentangling his coat tails, and now, jamming his hat over his ears, and waving his arms with a bat like motion, he climbed upon the seat of the chair and ejaculated the word ** Presto !" Then I found my voice. ** Stop him !" I cried in terror. ** Presto ! Presto !" shouted the Professor, balancing himself on the edge of his chair and waving his arms majestically, as if preparing for a sudden flight across the Scheldt, and firmly convinced that he not only meditated it, but was perfectly capable of attempting it. I covered my eyes with my hands. ** Are you ill, Mr. Kensett? " said the girl quietly. I raised my head indignantly. ** Not at all, Miss Wyeth. Only I'll bid you good evening, for this is the nineteenth century, and I'm a Christian." ** So am I," she said. ** So is my father." ** The devil he is," I thought. Her next words made me jump. ** Please do not be profane, Mr. Kensett. How did she know I was profane? I had not spoken a word. Could it be possible she was able to read my thoughts? This was too much, and I rose and bowed stiffly. I have the honour to bid you good evening, I began, and reluctantly turned to include the professor, expecting to see that gentleman balancing himself on his chair. The professor's chair was empty. Oh, said the girl faintly, my father has gone. Gone? Where? To... To India, I believe. I sank helplessly into my own chair. I do not think he will stay very long. He promised to return by eleven, she said timidly. I tried to realize the purport of it all. Gone to India? Gone? How? On a broomstick? Good heavens, I murmured. Am I sane? Perfectly, she said, and I am tired. You may take me back to the hotel. I scarcely heard her. I was feebly attempting to gather up my numbed wits. Slowly I began to comprehend the situation, to review the startling and humiliating events of the day. At noon in the court of the Hotel St. Antoine, I had been annoyed by a man and a cat. I had retired to my own room and had slept until dinner. In the evening I met two tourists on the seawall promenade. I had been beguiled into conversation. Yes into intimacy with these two tourists. I'd had the intention of embracing the faith of Pythagoras. Then I had mewed like a cat with all the strength of my lungs. Then the male tourist vanishes and leaves me in charge of the female tourists, alone and at night in a strange city. And now the female tourist proposes that I take her home. With a remnant of self-possession, I groped for my eyeglass, seized it, screwed it firmly into my eye and looked long and earnestly at the girl. As I looked, my eyes softened. My monocle dropped, and I forgot everything in the beauty and purity of the face before me. My heart began to beat against my stiff white waistcoat. Had I dared, yes, dared to think of this wondrous little beauty as a female tourist? Her pale, sweet face turned toward the sea, seemed to cast a spell upon the night. How loud my heart was beating. The yellow moon floated, half dipping in the sea, flooding land and water with enchanted lights. Wind and waves seemed to fill the spell of her eyes, for the breeze died away. The heaving scheldt tossed noiselessly, and the dark Dutch luggers swung idly on the tide with every sail a droop. A sudden hush fell over the land and water. The voices on the promenade were stilled. Little by little the shadowy throng, the terrace, the sea itself vanished, and I only saw her face shadowed against the moon. It seemed as if I had drifted miles above the earth, through all space and eternity, and there was naught between me and high heaven but that white face. Ah, how I loved her! I knew it. I never doubted it. Could years of passionate adoration touch her heart, her little heart, now beating so calmly with no thought of love, to startle it from its quiet and send it fluttering against the gentle breast? In her lap her clasped hands tightened, her eyelids drooped as though some pleasant thought was passing. I saw the colour dye her temples, I saw the blue eyes turn, half frightened to my own. I saw, and I knew she had read my thoughts. 
Then we both rose, side by side, and she was weeping softly, yet for my life I dared not speak. She turned away, touching her eyes with a bit of lace, and I sprang to her side and offered her my arm. You cannot go back alone, I said. She did not take my arm. Do you hate me, Miss Wyeth? I am very tired, she said. I must go home. You cannot go alone. I do not care to accept your escort. Then you send me away? No, she said in a hard voice. You can come if you like. So I humbly attended her to the Hotel St. Antoine. End of section 38 Recorded by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands Section 39 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 39. The Man at the Next Table. As we reached the place Verti and turned into the court of the hotel, the sound of the midnight bells swept over the city, and the horse car jingled slowly by on its last trip to the railway station. We passed the fountain bubbling and splashing in the moonlit court, and, crossing the square, entered the southern wing of the hotel. At the foot of the stairway, she leaned for an instant against the banisters. I'm afraid we have walked too fast, I said. She turned to me coldly. No. Conventionalities must be observed. You were quite right in escaping as soon as possible. But, I protested, I assure you. She gave a little movement of impatience. Don't, she said. You tire me. Conventionalities tire me. Be satisfied. Nobody has seen you. You are cruel, I said in a low voice. What do you think I care for, conventionalities? You care everything. You care what people think and you try to do what they say is good form. You never did such an original thing in your life as you have just done. You read my thoughts, I exclaimed bitterly. It is not fair. Fair or not, I know what you consider me. Ill-bred, common, pleased with any sort of attention. Oh, why should I waste one word, one thought on you? Miss Wyeth, I began, but she interrupted me. Would you dare tell me what you think of me? Would you dare tell me what you think of my father? I was silent. She turned and mounted two steps of the stairway, then faced me again. Do you think it was for my own pleasure that I permitted myself to be left alone with you? Do you imagine that I am flattered by your attention? Do you venture to think I ever could be? How dared you think what you did think there on the sea wall? I cannot help my thoughts, I replied. You turned on me like a tiger when you awoke from your trance. Do you really suppose that you mewed? Are you not aware that my father hypnotized you? No, I did not know it, I said, the hot blood tingling in my fingertips, and I looked angrily at her. Why do you imagine that I waste my time on you, she said. Your vanity has answered that question. Now, let your intelligence answer it. I am a Pythagorean. I have been chosen to bring in a convert, and you were the convert selected for me by the Mahatmas of the Consolidated Trust Company. I have followed you from New York to Antwerp, as I was bidden, but now my courage fails, and I shrink from fulfilling my mission, knowing you to be the type of man you are. If I could give you up, if I could only go away, never, never again to see you, Ah, I fear they will not permit it, until my mission is accomplished. Why was I chosen? I, with a woman's heart and a woman's pride? I, I hate you. I love you, I said slowly. She paled and looked away. Answer me, 
I said. Her wide blue eyes turned back again, and I held them with mine. At last she slowly drew a long-stemmed rose from the bunch at her belt, turned, and mounted the shadowy staircase. For a moment I thought I saw her pause on the landing above, but the moonlight was uncertain. After waiting for a long time in vain, I moved away, and in going raised my hand to my face, but I stopped short, and my heart stopped too for a moment. In my hand I held a long-stemmed rose. With my brain in a whirl I crept across the court and mounted the stairs to my room. Hour after hour I walked the floor slowly at first, and then more rapidly, but it brought no calm to the fierce tumult of my thoughts, and at last I dropped into a chair before the empty fireplace, burying my head in my hands. Uncertain, shocked, and deadly weary, I tried to think. I strove to bring order out of the chaos in my brain, but I only sat staring at the long-stemmed rose. Slowly I began to take a vague pleasure in its heavy perfume, and once I crushed a leaf between my palms, and, bending over, drank in the fragrance. Twice my lamp flickered and went out, and twice, treading softly, I crossed the room to relight it. Twice I threw open the door, thinking that I heard some sound without. How close the air was! How heavy and hot! And what was that strange, subtle odour which had insensibly filled the room? It grew stronger and more penetrating, and I began to dislike it, and to escape it I buried my nose in the half-open rose. Horror! The odour came from the rose! and the rose itself was no longer a rose, not even a flower now. It was only a bunch of catnip, and I dashed it to the floor and ground it under my heel. Montebank! I cried in a rage. My anger grew cold and I shivered, drawn perforce to the curtained window. Something was there, outside. I could not hear it, for it made no sound, but I knew it was there, watching me. What was it? The damp hair stirred on my head. I touched the heavy curtains. Whatever was outside them sprang up, tore at the window, and then rushed away. Feeling very shaky, I crept to the window, opened it, and leaned out. The night was calm. I heard the fountain splashing in the moonlight, and the sea winds soughing through the palms. Then I closed the window and turned back into the room. And as I stood there, a sudden breeze which could not have come from without, blew sharply in my face, extinguishing the candle and sending the long curtains, bellying out into the room. The lamp on the table flashed and smoked and sputtered. The room was littered with flying papers and catnip leaves. Then the strange wind died away, and somewhere in the night a cat snarled. I turned desperately to my trunk and flung it open. Into it I threw everything I owned. Pell-mell, closed the lid, locked it, and seized my Macintosh and traveling bag, ran down the stairs, crossed the court, and entered the night office of the hotel. There I called up the sleepy clerk, settled my reckoning, and sent a porter for a cab. Now, I said, what time does the next train leave? The next train for where? Anywhere! The clerk locked the safe and carefully, keeping the desk between himself and me, motioned the office boy to look at the timetables. Next train, 2.10. Brussels, Paris, read the boy. At that moment the cab rattled up by the curbstone, and I sprang in while the porter tossed my traps on top. Away we bumped over the stony pavement, past street after street, lighted dimly by tall gas lamps, and alley after alley, brilliant with the glare of villainous all-night cafe concerts. And then, turning, we rumbled past the circus and the El Dorado, and at last stopped with a jolt before the Brussels station. I had not a moment to lose. Paris! I cried. First class! And pocketed the book of coupons, hurried across the platform to where the Brussels train lay. A guard came running up, flung open the door of a first-class carriage, slammed and locked it. After I had jumped in, and the long train glided from the arch station out into the starlit morning. I was all alone in the compartment. The wretched lamp in the roof flickered dimly, scarcely lighting the stuffy box. I could not see to read my timetable, so I wrapped my legs in the travelling rug and lay back, staring out into the misty morning. Trees, walls, telegraph poles flashed past, 
and the cinders drove in showers against the rattling windows. I slept at times, fitfully, and once, springing up, peered sharply at the opposite seat, possessed with the idea that someone was there. When the train reached Brussels, I was sound asleep, and the guard awoke me with difficulty. Breakfast, sir? he asked. Anything, I sighed and stepped out to the platform, rubbing my legs and shivering. The other passengers were already breakfasting in the station cafe, and I joined them and managed to swallow a cup of coffee and a roll. The morning broke, grey and cloudy, and I bundled myself into my Macintosh for a tramp along the platform. Up and down I stamped, puffing a cigar and digging my hands deep in my pockets while the other passengers huddled into the warmer compartments of the train or stood watching the luggage being lifted into the forward mail carriage. The wait was very long. The hands of the great clock pointed to six, and still the train lay motionless along the platform. I approached a guard and asked him whether anything was wrong. Accident on the line, he replied. Monsieur had better go to his compartment and try to sleep, for we may be delayed until noon. I followed the guard's advice and crawled into my corner, wrapped myself in the rug, and lay back watching the raindrops spattering along the window sill. At noon the train had not moved, and I lunched in the compartment. At four o'clock in the afternoon the station-master came hurrying along the platform, crying, Montez, Montez, Monsieur, Dame Sibylle, and the train steamed out of the station, and whirled away through the flat, treeless Belgian plains. At times I dozed, but the shaking of the car always awoke me, and I would sit blinking out at the endless stretch of plain until the sudden flurry of rain blotted the landscape from my eyes. At last, a long shrill whistle from the engine, a jolt, a series of bumps, and an apparition of red trousers and bayonets warned me that we had arrived at the French frontier. I turned out with the others and opened my valise for inspection, but the customs officials merely chalked it without examination, and I hurried back to my compartment amid the shouting of guards and the clanging of station bells. Again I found that I was alone in the compartment, so I smoked a cigarette, thanked heaven, and fell into a dreamless sleep. How long I slept I do not know, but when I awoke the train was roaring through a tunnel. When again it flashed out into the open country, I peered through the grimy, rain-stained window and saw that the storm had ceased and stars were twinkling in the sky. I stretched my legs, yawned, pushed my travelling cap back from my forehead and stumbled to my feet, walked up and down the compartment until my cramped muscles were relieved. Then I sat down again and, lighting a cigar, puffed great rings and clouds of fragrant smoke across the aisle. The train was flying, the cars lurched and shook and the windows rattled accompaniment to the creaking panels. The smoke from my cigar dimmed the lamp in the ceiling and hid the opposite seat from view. How it curled and writhed in the corners, now eddying upward, now floating across the aisle like a veil. I lounged back in my cushioned seat, watching it with interest. What queer shapes it took! How thick it was becoming! How strangely luminous! Now it had filled the whole compartment, puff after puff, crowding upward, waving, wavering, clouding the windows and blotting the lamp from sight. It was most interesting. I'd never before smoked such a cigar. What an extraordinary brand! I examined the end, flicking the ashes away. The cigar was out. Fumbling for a match to relight it, my eyes fell on the drifting smoke curtain which swayed across the corner opposite. It seemed almost tangible. Now, like a real curtain, it hung grey, impenetrable. A man might hide behind it. Then an idea came into my head, and it persisted until my uneasiness amounted to a vague terror. I tried to fight it off. I strove to resist, but the conviction slowly settled upon me that something was behind that smoke veil, something which had entered the compartment while I slept. It can't be. I muttered, my eyes fixed on the misty drapery. The train has not stopped. The car creaked and trembled. I sprang to my feet and swept my arm through the veil of smoke. Then my hair slowly rose on my head, for my hand touched another hand, 
and my eyes had met two other eyes. My senses reeled. I heard a voice in the gloom, low and sweet, calling me by name. I saw the eyes again, tender and blue. Soft fingers touched my own. Are you afraid? she said. My heart began to beat again, and my face warmed with returning blood. It is only I, she said gently. I seemed to hear my own voice speaking as if at a great distance. You here, alone? How cruel of you, she faltered. I am not alone. At the same instant, my eyes fell upon the professor, calmly seated by the further window. His hands were thrust into the folds of a corded and tasseled dressing gown, from beneath which peeped two enormous feet encased in carpet slippers. Upon his head towered a yellow nightcap. He did not pay the slightest attention to either me or his daughter, and except for the lighted cigar which he kept shifting between his lips, he might have been taken for a wax dummy. Then I began to speak, feebly, hesitating like a child. How did you come into this compartment? You, you do not possess wings, I suppose. You could not have been here all the time. Would you explain? Explain to me. See, I, I ask you very humbly, for I do not understand. This is the 19th century, and these things don't fit in. I'm wearing a Dunlap hat. I've got a copy of the New York Herald in my bag. President Cleveland is alive, and everything is so very commonplace in the world. Is this real magic? Perhaps I'm filled with hallucinations. Perhaps I'm sleeping and dreaming. Perhaps you are not really here nor i nor anybody nor anything the train plunged into a tunnel and when again it dashed out from the other end the cold wind blew furiously in my face from the further window it was wide open the professor was gone papa has changed to another compartment she said quietly i think perhaps you were beginning to bore him her eyes met mine and she smiled faintly. Are you very much bewildered? I looked at her in silence. She sat very quietly, her white hands clasped above her knee, her curly hair glittering to her girdle. A long robe, almost silvery in the twilight, clung to her young figure. Her bare feet were thrust deep into a pair of shimmering eastern slippers. When you fled, she sighed, I was asleep, and there was no time to lose. I barely had a moment to go to Bombay, to find Papa, and return in time to join you. This is an East Indian costume. Still, I was silent. Are you shocked? she said simply. No, I replied in a dull voice. I'm past that. You are very rude, she said, with the tears starting to her eyes. I do not mean to be. I only wish to go away, away somewhere and find out what my name is. Your name is Harold Kensett. Are you sure? I asked eagerly. Yes. What troubles you? Is everything plain to you? Are you a sort of prophet and second sight medium? Is nothing hidden from you? I asked. Nothing? She faltered. My head ached and I clasped it in my hand. A sudden change came over her. I am human. Believe me, she said with piteous eagerness. Indeed, I do not seem strange to those who understand. You wonder, because you left me at midnight in Antwerp, and you wake to find me here. If, because I find myself reincarnated, endowed with senses and capabilities which few at present possess, if I am so made... Why should it seem strange? It is all so natural to me. If I appear to you... Appear? Yes. Elsie, I cried. Can you vanish? Yes, she murmured. Does it seem to you unwomanly? Great heaven, I groaned. Don't, she cried with tears in her voice. Oh, please don't. Help me to bear it. If you only knew how awful it is to be different from other girls, how mortifying it is to me to be able to vanish. Oh, how I hate and detest it all. 
** Don't cry," I said, looking at her pity ingly. ** Oh dear me !" she sobbed, ** you shudder at the sight of me because I can vanish !"** I don't !" I cried. ** Yes, you do ! You abhor me — you shrink away. Oh, why did I ever see you ? Why did you ever come into my life ? What have I done in ages past that now, reborn, I suffer cruelly — cruelly ?"** What do you mean ?" I whispered. My voice trembled with happiness. ** I ?" Nothing — but you think me a fabled mon ster !"** Elsie !"** My sweet Elsie !" I said, ** I don't think you a fabled monster — I love you ! See — see — I am at your feet ! Listen to me, my darling !" She turned her blue eyes to mine. I saw tears sparkling on the curved lashes. ** Elsie, I love you !" I said again. Slowly she raised her white hands to my head and held it a moment, looking at me strangely. Then her face grew nearer to my own. Her glittering hair fell over my shoulders, her lips rested on mine. In that long, sweet kiss, the beating of her heart answered mine, and I learned a thousand truths, wonderful, mysterious, splendid, but when our lips fell apart, the memory of what I learned departed also. ** It was so very simple and beautiful," she sighed, ** and I — I never saw it. But the Mahatmas knew — ah, they knew that my mission could only be accomplished through love. ** And it is," I whispered, ** for you shall teach me, me your husband, and — and you will not be impatient. You will try to believe. I will believe what you tell me, my sweetheart. Even about cats. Before I could reply, the further window opened, and a yellow nightcap, followed by the professor, entered from somewhere without. Elsie sank back on her sofa, but the professor needed not to be told, and we both knew he was already busily reading our thoughts. For a moment there was dead silence, long enough for the professor to grasp the full significance of what had passed. Then he uttered a single exclamation. Oh! After a while, however, he looked at me for the first time that evening, saying, Congratulate you, Mr. Kensett, I'm sure, tied several knots in the cord of his dressing gown, lighted a cigar, and paid no further attention to either of us. Some moments later, he opened the window again and disappeared. I looked across the aisle at Elsie. You may come over beside me, she said shyly. End of section 39 Read by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands Section 40 of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Adrian Strowett, Turks and Caicos Islands. The Maker of Moons and Other Stories by Robert W. Chambers. Section 40. The Man at the Next Table. It was nearly ten o'clock and our train was rapidly approaching Paris. We passed village after village wrapped in mist, station after station hung with twinkling red and blue and yellow lanterns, then sped on again with the echo of the switch bells ringing in our ears. When at length the train slowed up and stopped, I opened the window and looked out upon a long wet platform shining under the electric lights. A guard came running by throwing open the doors of each compartment and crying, Paris next! Tickets if you please! I handed him my book of coupons, from which he tore several and handed it back. Then he lifted his lantern and appeared into the compartment, saying, Is Monsieur alone? I turned to Elsie. He wants your ticket. Give it to me. What's that? demanded the guard. I looked anxiously at Elsie. If your father has the tickets, I began, 
but was interrupted by the guard who snapped, Monsieur will give himself the trouble to understand that I do not understand English. Keep quiet, I said sharply in French. I'm not speaking to you. The guard stared stupidly at me, then at my luggage, and finally entered the car, knelt down, and peered under the seats. Presently he got up, very red in the face, and went out slamming the door. He had not paid the slightest attention to Elsie, but I distinctly heard him say, Only Englishmen and idiots talk to themselves. Elsie, I faltered, do you mean to say that guard could not see you? She began to look so serious again that I merely added, Never mind, I don't care whether you are invisible or not, dearest. I am not invisible to you, she said. Why should you care? The great noise of bells and whistles drowned our voices, and amid the whirring of switch bells, the hissing of steam and the cries of, Paris, all out! Our train glided into the station. It was the professor who opened the door of our carriage. There he stood, calmly adjusting his yellow nightcap, and drawing his dressing gown closer with the corded tassels. Where have you been? I asked. On the engine. In the engine, I suppose you mean? I said. No, I don't. I mean on the engine. On the pilot. It was very refreshing. Where are we going now? Do you know Paris? I asked Elsie, turning to me. Yes. I think your father had better take you to the Hotel Normandie on the Rue de l'Echelle. But you must stay there too. Of course, if you wish. She laughed nervously. Don't you see that my father and I could not take rooms now? You must engage three rooms for yourself. Why? I asked stupidly. Oh dear. Why? Because we are invisible. I tried to repress a shudder. The professor gave Elsie his arm, and as I studied his ensemble, I thanked heaven that he was invisible. At the gate of the station, I hailed a four-seated cab, and we rattled away through the stony streets, brilliant with gas jets, and in a few moments rolled smoothly across the avenue, the Opera, turned into the Rue de l'Echelle, and stopped. A bright little page, all over buttons, came out, took my luggage, and preceded us into the hallway. I, with Elsie on my arm and the professor shuffling along beside me, walked over to the desk. Room? We have a very desirable room on the second fronting, the Rue saint Honore. But we, that is, I want three rooms, three separate rooms, I said. The clerk scratched his chin. Monsieur is expecting friends? Say yes, whispered Elsie, with a suspicion of laughter in her voice. Yes, I repeated feebly. Gentlemen, of course, said the clerk, looking at me narrowly. One lady. Married, of course. What's that to you? I said sharply. What do you mean by speaking to us? Us? I mean to me, I said, badly rattled. Give me the rooms and let me get to bed, will you? Monsieur will remember, said the clerk coldly, that this is an old and respectable hotel. I know it, I said, smothering my rage. The clerk eyed me suspiciously. Front! he called with irritating deliberation show this gentleman to apartment ten how many rooms are there i demanded three sleeping rooms and a parlour i will take it i said with composure on probation muttered the clerk insolently swallowing the insult i followed the bell-boy up the stairs keeping between him and elsie for i dreaded to see him walk through her as if she were thin air a trim maid rose to meet us and conducted us through a hallway into a large apartment. She threw open all the bedroom doors and said, Will Monsieur have the goodness to choose? Which will you take? I began turning to Elsie. I? Monsieur? cried the startled maid. That completely upset me. Here, I muttered, slipping some silver into her hand. Now for the love of heaven, run away. When she had vanished with a doubtful, Merci, Monsieur, I handed the professor the keys and asked him to settle the thing with Elsie. Elsie took the corner room, the professor rambled into the next one, and I said good night and crept wearily into my own chamber. I sat down and tried to think. A great feeling of fatigue weighted my spirits. I could think better with my clothes off, I said, and slipped the coat from my shoulders. 
How tired I was !** I could think better in bed," I muttered, flinging my cravat on the dresser and tossing my shirt studs after it. I was certainly very tired. ** Now," I yawned, grasping the pillow and drawing it under my head, ** now I can think a bit." But before my head fell on the pillow, sleep closed my eyes. I began to dream at once. It seemed as though my eyes were wide open and the Professor was standing beside my bed. ** Young man," he said, ** you 've won my daughter and you must pay the piper." ** What piper ?" I said. ** The Pied Piper of Hamelin, I don't think," replied the Professor, vulgarly, and before I could realize what he was doing, he had drawn a reed pipe from his dressing gown and was playing a strangely annoying air. Then an awful thing occurred. Cats began to troop into the room. Cats by the hundred, Toms and Tabbies, Grey, Yellow, Maltese, Persian, Manx, all purring and all marching round and round, rubbing against the furniture, the Professor, and even against me. I struggled with the nightmare. Take them away! I tried to gasp. Nonsense, he said. Here is an old friend. I saw the white tabby cat of the Hotel St. Antoine. An old friend, he repeated, and played a dismal melody on his reed. I saw Elsie enter the room, lift the white tabby in her arms and bring her to my side. Shake hands with him, she commanded. To my horror, the tabby deliberately extended a paw and tapped me on the knuckles. Oh, I cried in agony. This is a horrible dream. Why, oh, why can't I wake? Yes, she said, dropping the cat. It is partly a dream, but some of it is real. Remember what I say, my darling. You are to go tomorrow morning and meet the twelve o'clock train from Antwerp at the Gare du Nord. Papa and I are coming to Paris on that train. Don't you know that we are not really here now, you silly boy? Good night, then. I shall be very glad to see you. I saw her glide from the room, followed by the professor, playing a gay quick step to which the cats danced two and two. Good night, sir, said each cat as it passed my bed, and I dreamed no more. When I awoke, the room, the bed, had vanished. I was in the street, walking rapidly. The sun shone down on the broad white pavements of Paris, and the streams of busy life flowed past me on either side. How swiftly I was walking! Where the devil was I going? Surely I had business somewhere that needed immediate attention. I tried to remember when I had awakened, but I could not. I wondered where I had dressed myself. I had apparently taken great pains with my toilet, for I was immaculate, monocle and all, even down to the long-stemmed rose nestling in my buttonhole. I knew Paris had recognized the streets through which I was hurrying. Where could I be going? What was my hurry? I glanced at my watch and found that I had not a moment to lose. Then, as the bells of the city rang out midday, I hastened into the railway station on the Rue Lafayette and walked out to the platform, and as I looked down the glittering track around a distant curve, shot a locomotive followed by a long line of cars. Nearer and nearer it came, while the station gong sounded and the switch bells began ringing all along the track. Antwerp Express! cried the sous chef de guerre. And as the train slipped along the tiled platform, I sprang upon the steps of a first-class carriage and threw open the door. How do you do, Mr. Kensett? said Elsie Wyeth, springing lightly to the platform. Really, it's very nice of you to come to the train. At the same moment, a bald, mild-eyed gentleman emerged from the depths of the same compartment, carrying a large covered basket. How are you, Kensett? he said. Glad to see you again. Rather warm in that compartment. No, I will not trust this basket to an expressman. Give Miss Wyeth your arm and I'll follow. We go to the Normandy, I believe. All the morning I had Elsie to myself, and at dinner I sat beside her with the professor opposite. The latter was cheerful enough, but he nearly ruined my dinner, for he smelt strongly of catnip. After dinner he became restless and fidgeted about in his chair until coffee was brought, and we went up to the parlour of his apartment. Here his restlessness increased to such an extent that I ventured to ask him if he was in good health. It's that basket, the covered basket which I have in the next room, he said. What's the trouble with the basket? I asked. The basket's all right, but the contents worry me. May I inquire what the contents are? I ventured. The professor rose. Yes, 
he said. You may inquire of my daughter. He left the room, but reappeared shortly, carrying a saucer of milk. I watched him enter the next room, which was mine. What on earth is he taking that into my room for? I asked Elsie. I don't keep cats. But you will, she said. I? Never. You will if I ask you to. But, but you won't ask me. But I do. Elsie, Harold, I detest cats. You must not. I can't help it. You will when I ask it. Have I not given myself to you? Would you not make a little sacrifice for me? I don't understand. Would you refuse my first request? No, I said miserably. I will keep dozens of cats. I do not ask that. I only wish that you keep one. Was that what your father had in that basket? I asked suspiciously. Yes, the basket came from Antwerp. What? The white Antwerp cat? I cried. Yes. And you asked me to keep that cat? Oh, Elsie, listen, she said. I have a long story to tell you. Come nearer, close to me. You say you love me. I bent and kissed her. Then I shall put you to the proof, she murmured. Prove me. Listen, that cat is the same cat that ran out of the apartment in the Waldorf when your great aunt ceased to exist, in human shape. My father and myself have received word from the Mahatmas of the trust company, sheltered and cherished the cat. We were ordered by the Mahatmas to convert you. The task was appalling, but there is no such thing as refusing a command, and we laid our plans. That man with the white spot in his hair was my father. What? Your father is bald. He wore a wig then. The white spot came from dropping chemicals on the wig while experimenting with a substance which you could not comprehend. Then, then that clue was useless. But who could have taken the crimson diamond? And who was the man with the white spot on his head who tried to sell the stone in Paris? That was my father. He? He st took the crimson diamond? I cried aghast. Yes and no. That was only a paste stone that he had in Paris. It was to draw you over here. He had the real crimson diamond also. Your father? Yes. He has it in the next room now. Can you not see how it disappeared, Harold? Why, the cat swallowed it. Do you mean to say that the white tabby swallowed the crimson diamond? By mistake. She tried to get it out of the velvet bag and, as the bag was also full of catnip, she could not resist a mouthful, and unfortunately just then you broke in the door and so startled the cat that she swallowed the crimson diamond. There was a painful pause. At last I said, Elsie, as you are able to vanish, I suppose you also are able to converse with cats. I am, she replied, trying to keep back the tears of mortification. And that cat told you this? She did and my crimson diamond is inside that cat. It is. Then, said I firmly, I am going to chloroform the cat. Harold, she cried in terror, that cat is your great aunt. I don't know to this day how I stood the shock of that announcement, or how I managed to listen while Elsie tried to explain the transgression theory, but it was all Chinese to me. I only knew that I was a blood relation of a cat, and the thought nearly drove me mad. Try, my darling, try to love her, whispered Elsie. She must be very precious to you. Yes, with my diamond inside her, I replied faintly. You must not neglect her, said Elsie. Oh, no, I'll always have my eye on her. I mean, I will surround her with luxury, uh, milk, and bones, and catnip, and books, uh... Does she read? Not the books that human beings read. Now go and speak to your aunt, Harold. Eh? How the deuce? Go. For my sake, try to be cordial. She rose and led me unresistingly to the door of my room. Good heavens, I groaned. This is awful. Courage, my darling, she whispered. Be brave for love of me. I drew her to me and kissed her. 
Beads of cold perspiration started in the roots of my hair, but I clenched my teeth and entered the room alone. The room was dark and I stood silent, not knowing where to turn, fearful lest I step on the cat, my aunt. Then through the dreary silence I called, Auntie! A faint noise broke upon my ear, and my heart grew sick, but I strode into the darkness, calling hoarsely, Aunt Tabby! It is your nephew! Again the faint sound. Something was stirring there among the shadows. A shape moving softly along the wall, a shade which glided by me, paused, wavered, and darted under the bed. Then I threw myself on the floor, profoundly moved, begging, imploring my aunt to come to me. Auntie! Auntie! I murmured. Your nephew is waiting to take you to his heart. And at last I saw my great aunt's eyes shining in the dark. Close the door. That meeting is not for the eyes of the world. Close the door upon that sacred scene where great aunt and nephew are united at last. The End End of Section 40 Read by Adrian Strowett Turks and Caicos Islands End of The Maker of Moons and Other Stories By Robert W. Chambers